Good evening, everyone. I, Dr. Shreya Lal, on behalf of entire MQ Pharmaceuticals Limited team, welcome all of you. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. This individual is a true luminary in their field, possessing a wealth of knowledge and expertise that is certain to captivate and enlighten all of us. Allow me to introduce Dr. Mika Satyanarayana Sir, who has made significant contribution towards HIV treatment, prevention, and education. Throughout this webinar, Dr. Satyanarayan Sir will be sharing their valuable insights on recent updates on PREP and PEP. Allow me to take this opportunity to, in, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Satnarayana sir. So sir is practicing HIV AIDS medicine at Kukatpalli, Hyderabad since 1998. Sir visits rural areas in Telangana where the HIV prevalence is high and provides treatment services to the needy at affordable costs. Sir is director at Aswini HIV Care and ID Clinics at Kukatpalli, Hyderabad. Sir has conducted several CMEs on professional platforms and awareness programs in electronic, social, and print media. Sir has graduated from Andhra, Medic Andhra Medical College, Vishaka Patnam, and has undergone training in HIV AIDS medicine from NACO, Grant Medical Foundation and the University of South Florida, Howard Medical School, Boston, and John Hopkins, Baltimore. Sir has participated in several knowledge acquiring conferences in HIV AIDS at Glasgow, CROI in San Francisco, Washington DC, Kuala Lumpur, Johannesburg and Melbourne. Sir is a member of International AIDS Society, life member at AIDS Society of India, member of Treat Asia, lifetime member of HIV Medicine Association of India and life member infectious Diseases Society of India. So, without further ado, let me warmly welcome Dr. Satyanarayana Sir as they take the virtual stage for today's webinar on recent updates on PREP and PEP. Over to you, sir. Thank as you, Madam. Welcome. Thank you uh, very much for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, say, Madam. Uh, good evening, everybody. Shall I start? Yes, sir. Definitely. Yes, sir. At the outset, I thank uh, MQ Pharma uh, for giving me this uh, great opportunity to talk on pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, that is usually uh, commonly called as a PrEP in the context of uh, preventing transmission of HIV in high-risk vulnerable individuals. First of all, let us see the recent demographic scenario of HIV in India. India has the largest, second largest HIV burden in the world. The overall adult HIV prevalence rate in India remains low for the last few years at around 0.21%. But in key populations like female sex workers, the prevalence is nine times higher and among MSMs, it is 16 times higher. Among the transgenders, it is about 18 times higher. And among IV drug users, it is, it is alarmingly 43 times higher than the overall adult prevalence rate. In these settings, prevention of transmission in high-risk vulnerable populations is very, very crucial to avoid the further spread of HIV disease in the community. The recommendations that we are going to discuss now are mostly from Western world, mostly from uh, uh, Center for Disease Control, CDC. In the US, nowadays, 20% of all new HIV infections are from people aged between 30 to 24 years. And 81% of all those newly diagnosed were from young MSMs, many of whom could not able to access the PrEP facility. The same situation may also prevail in our country very soon. In this scenario, 
many vulnerable adolescents and young adults can benefit from prep this is the reason why scaling of prep is very very important till now prep is not very popular in our country national technical guidelines for prep were introduced by naco in 2020 as of date prep is not introduced into the national program all of you must have known that there are four transmission routes shown in this picture but nowadays most hiv transmissions occur through anal or vaginal sex and sharing of needles and syringes transmission through blood and blood products and mother to child has become very very infrequent because of the screening of blood and blood banks and the ppct program being conducted by naco among the different modes of sexual transmission unprotected anal sex either it is insertive or receptive and unprotected vaginal sex either it is insertive or receptive are very common through unprotected oral sex hiv transmission occurs very very infrequently as all of you must uh, know that uh, art which was introduced in 1996 has changed the outlook of hiv and aids in india in not over in the uh, over globe to a virtual death sentence to a chronic manageable disease like diabetes and hypertension now with a successful antiretroviral treatment the hiv infected can lead a near normal life or a life span with good quality of life previously we used to advise all the zero discordant even sometimes zero concordant couples also to follow safe sex practices by using condoms nowadays we must be proactive in telling all these zero discordant couples in our day to day clinical practice to consider condomless sex which is not at all risky if the positive partner is an art with good adherence and maintains undetectable viral loads this is a very important scientific advancement in the treatment of hiv we can say be proactive to communicate this message to all even to our own professional colleagues who may not be knowing this that u is equal to u is undetectable is untransmittable another important aspect is treatment treatment as prevention is the most important advancement in terms of quality of life improving the quality of life in hiv infected individuals in this hptno 5 to study early initiation of art reduces the risk of transmission of hiv in zero discordant couples as compared to delayed initiation of art in the partnership study which is an observational study looked at the risk of transmission of the virus in any form of sexual intercourse either anal or vaginal or in any group of heterosexual man or women or in msms if the source zero positive partner is undetectable the risk of transmission to the zero negative partner with unprotected sex is almost zero among these hiv transmission preventive strategies so biomedical pharmacological behavioral structural constitutional the prep plays an important role in zero negative high risk individuals we know the prep concept is there for more than a decade but it has not become a very popular one nowadays we see a lot of educated msms coming to our clinics and proactively asking for prep prep should be offered as a part of combination preventive strategies that includes condom condom uses and the and the different behavior strategies may, i mean seen in this slide so this is the overview 
of the topics that I am going to cover under these headings in the next uh, 45 minutes or so, if time permits. Why do we need PrEP? To some extent, uh, we have already discussed the importance of PrEP, why it should be needed now. Evaluating the PrEP safety and efficacy. Who can prescribe the PrEP? Who can benefit from the PrEP? What should we know before prescribing the PrEP? And guidelines for prescribing the PrEP, are there any consideration in the special populations? And lastly, we will review the entire, entire presentation. Let's begin by knowing what is PrEP and why do we need it? So coming to the definition of the PrEP, PrEP is the use of antiretroviral medications by people without HIV to protect themselves from getting HIV. PrEP is recommended for adults or adolescents weighing at least 35 kg and usually for those who are at the risk of getting HIV through sex or IV drug uses. Three medications were approved for use as a PrEP. Two medications are taken orally among these three and uh, consists of two drugs combined into a single pill used daily. The composition of the pills are tenofovir, this proxyl fumarate 300 milligrams in combination with m 200 milligrams, usually known as TDF-FTC. Another pill is tenofibir this proxyl fumarate 300 milligrams plus lamivudin 300 milligrams known as TDF-3TC is recommended by NACO from 2020 or so. Third preparation is Tinofavir alfanamide, 25 milligrams in combination with emtricitabine, 200 milligrams, known as TAF FTC. Note that this TAF FTC is not approved for use by women or other people who could get HIV through receptive vaginal sex. It is used mostly only in MSMs, it is approved. The third medication is an injectable formulation recently approved by FDA, that is Cobatagravir 600 milligrams, given once in every two months as an intramuscular injection by a healthcare provider in a hospital setting. At present, it is very expensive and it is not available in India. Our pharma companies are uh, trying hard to bring it uh, with a generic in, in, in the market soon. The major advantage of PrEP is that it adds another effective HIV preventing option or tool to the list of preventing strategies earlier we discussed in the previous slide. It is not to be consumed for lifelong. That is one, of, one major point. Rather than, rather it can be started during periods of higher risk and as well, it can be stopped during the no risk periods. Now, let's take a look at the clinical evidence for PrEP, efficacy and safety, the very, very important aspect. Coming to the PrEP efficacy. PrEP has been demonstrated in multiple studies as a highly effective tool when taken as prescribed. PrEP's effectiveness varies between transmission routes. When taken as uh, uh, prescribed, PrEP reduces the risk of, risk of uh, uh, getting HIV from sex by about 99% and from IV drug use uh, at least by 74%. It should be noted that the estimated effectiveness for people who inject drugs is studied based on tenofovir usage alone. So the effectiveness of two drug oral therapies containing tenofamir may be a higher than this 74 uh, percentage. But PrEP's effectiveness is highly dependent on adherence. With missed doses, the effectiveness will be naturally decreased. There are 
we discussed earlier there are three types of preps are generally all these three types of preps are generally well tolerated with side effects that may usually mild to moderate in severity they are manageable and they are temporary less than 10% of patients only will get the side effects those who initiated on oral prep with taf ftc are uh, 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 are tdf ftc or tdf lamivudine that is taf ftc i mean tdf ftc and tdf 3 tc are taf ftc they report experiencing some sort of startup syndromes these syndromes are typically consists of headache nausea and abdominal discomfort and does not last longer than one month the symptoms can usually be managed with uh, symptomatic uh, medicines like over the counter medicines like nsaids but no startup syndrome has been reported for patients starting on injectable prep that is covertegravir if a patient is concerned about side effects in injectable prep an optional four week lead in period of daily oral covertegravir can be prescribed before the patient receives the first dose of injection coming to the kidney safety the use of tdf ftc tdf 3 tc for prep was associated with a small decrease in creatinine clearance that did not get worse and return to normal levels once the patient stops using the drug taf ftc is associated with a lower risk of kidney related side effects no risk of kidney related side effects has been reported with injectable prep covertegravir that is an advantage with that all patients starting on oral prep should have their creatinine clearance checked and then monitored while they are using the prep tdf ftc or tdf 3 tc in msms was observed to be associated with a small decrease in bone mineral density but this decrease was not associated with increased incidence of fractures there are no reported bone safety issues for taf ftc or covertegravir but injection site reactions are common in patients receiving covertegravir and typically include pain tenderness and swelling at the uh, swelling of the skin at the injection site these reactions typically are mild to moderate usually last for few days after the injection and can be managed with over the counter painkillers they usually decrease in severity after the first or two or three injections coming to weight gain weight gain and increased triglyceride levels have been observed in patients using taf and ftc weight and lipid levels should be monitored in patients using this drug tdf ftc or tdf 3 tc and covertegravir have not been reported to affect weight or lipid levels this clinical trial data suggests that there is no increase in the behavioral risk with the use of prep the charts in the left show that among at high risk men who have who have sex with men that msms the number of sex partners the incidence of condom use were similar when the participants were prescribed prep or placebo that means there is no increased behavioral risk with prep the chart in the right presents the results of the bangkok trial that is bangkok tinofovi study which showed a general decrease in hiv acquisition due to iv drug use when prep was included in the hiv prevention strategy of their government programs let us know who can prescribe prep in our regular day to day clinical practice as per our national technical guidelines guidelines given by naco in 2020 prep can be prescribed by any registered medical practitioner qualified in modern medicine preferably trained in national guidelines the prescriber is he, he need not to have be a infectious disease specialist 
PrEP can be given by a general physician also, HIV caregiving physicians, sexually transmitted treating, in, uh, sexually transmitted treated infectious treating venereologists, and of course, substance use treating physicians, psychiatrists also can prescribe PrEP. We have to understand that PrEP is a preventive measure for HIV that can be readily integrated into primary care. As primary care physicians regularly prescribing the preventive measures like uh, metformin for uh, pre-diabetics, uh, statins for those who, who are at the risk of getting cardiovascular disease, and oral contraceptives for the preventive prevention of uh, unintended or unwanted pregnancies. Similarly, PrEP also can be prescribed as a preventive measure. In fact, making PrEP available in primary care settings as a part of routine preventive health care. It can improve access for all the needy who could benefit from PrEP. It also helps to address the existing disparities in PrEP uses. Till now, we have covered an introduction, what is PrEP and the PrEP medications available in the market. Let us move to discuss who can benefit from PrEP. PrEP is extremely useful to those who are unable to wear or negotiate condom use with their partner or partners are people who inject drugs but are not able to obtain no injection equipment are people who do not use condoms or new injection equipment consistently for whatever the reason behind. PrEP is for adults and adolescents without HIV who are at risk of getting HIV from sex or injection drug use as we discussed earlier. As per the 2021 CDC PrEP guidelines, we should inform all sexually active adults and adolescents about PrEP as a graded recommendation 3B. Giving patients information about PrEP equips them not only to take steps to protect themselves from HIV, but also share that information with the social networks, other friends and all who may be benefit from PrEP. Making conversation about PrEP can help patients to overcome embarrassment and stigma so that they can respond accurately to risk assessment questions. Now, we know that registered medical practitioners of modern medicine with little training in national program guidelines can prescribe PrEP and PEP. Now, let us talk a little about what Prescribers should know before prescribing PEP. Remember, PrEP does not prevent sexually transmitted infections like syphilis, gonorrhea, hepatitis B virus, herpes simplex virus, chlamydia, etc. Of course, it also doesn't prevent unintended pregnancies. Coming to the importance of taking sexual history. Obtaining a sexual history is recommended for all adult and adolescent patients as a part of ongoing primary care. However, a comprehensive sexual history is not required to advise PrEP. Healthcare providers can introduce the discussion about the patient's sexual history by emphasizing that these are routine questions and that everything they talk about will be kept confidential between the patient and doctor. We have to give that reassurance to the patient. While taking sexual history, adopt the five piece strategy. Five piece means determine the partner's practices, protection from STS, past history of STS, pregnancy intention, means determine the number and gender of sex partners, inquire about the high risk practices, discuss the risk, risk reduction strategies and the need for STI testing. Discuss protection strategies to prevent STIs. Inquire about the history of STIs in the past, having a history of STI can place the patients at a greater risk of acquiring HIV. Discuss the pregnancy intention plans. 
So these are the some more examples of uh, uh, of a brief risk assessment questions. It is important to talk to all the patients who may be at risk of HIV through sex or injection drug use. Starting the conversation by informing patients about PrEP and its benefits and respond openly to questions about their sexual and drug abuse, uh, drug use behaviors. Once you have introduced PrEP, begin to ask the patient about their sexual behaviors. Assure them that these questions are routine and the information they shall, as we discussed earlier, will be kept confidential. Be sure to use a local language which is understandable or which is familiar to the patients. So now let us talk something I mean, uh, uh, about the guidelines uh, for prescribing PrEP. This is a CDC recommendation algorithm for assessing a sexually active patient for PrEP. This algorithm includes a brief set of questions designed to assess key risk factors for getting HIV. PrEP should be prescribed for patients who have a sexual partner with HIV, who has an unknown or detectable viral load, or patients who have one or more sexual partners of unknown HIV status and have not consistently used condoms, or patients who have had a bacterial STI in the past six months period. It is important to note that sometimes the patient may request PrEP to protect themselves from HIV, but not feel comfortable reporting HIV risk factors because they anticipate receiving stigmatizing responses for the healthcare workers, from the healthcare workers. For this reason, patients who request PrEP should be offered regardless of their risk assessment responses. This slide is uh, for assessing persons who inject drugs for PrEP. This slide presents a recommended algorithm for assessing a patient who inject drugs for PrEP and include questions about their risky injection practices. PrEP should be prescribed for patients who have injected drugs within the past six months and shared their syringes and needles. This is a, a very important uh, step in giving before giving a PrEP a laboratory assessment. Baseline laboratory testing should be performed prior to starting of PrEP with either oral medication or injectable covitogravir. First of all, we have to do a HIV test to confirm that the patient does not have HIV. Laboratory-based HIV antigen antibody tests are the preferred method, but a minimum documentation of negative antibody test within one week before the patient initiated PrEP is required. If patient is been reinitiating on PrEP and used oral PrEP within the last three months or injectable PrEP within the last 12 months, testing should include an antigen antibody test and a qualitative or a quantitative HA1 RNA PCR test. Oral rapid HIV test should not be used to screen PrEP candidates for HIV because they are less sensitive than blood tests. Any patient with a reactive test should be linked to HIV care and treatment. Acute HIV should be suspected if the patient reports a recent exposure. Ask all PrEP candidates with a negative or indeterminate HIV test result about whether they have experienced any signs and symptoms of acute retroviral syndrome in the month prior or on the day of evaluation. Coming to kidney function. Kidney function must be assessed for all the patients initiating an oral PrEP. When used as a PrEP, TDF can cause a mild decrease in kidney function, usually remain within the normal range and it is of no clinical significance. Typically, it reverses when the patient starts PrEP. Occasional cases of sometimes acute kidney failure 
including fanconi like syndrome have been occurred and reported kidney function should be assessed by calculated estimated creatinine clearance that is with estimated gfr egfr using a cockrell gull formula tdf ftc is approved for use in people with egfr more than 60 ml per minute only and taf and ftc is approved for use in people with egfr of more than 30 ml per minute so as you know that taf is we know protective to some extent kidney function does not need to be assessed for patients being prescribed on injectable prep because injectable cobetagravir doesn't have any renal side effects additional baseline laboratory testing prior to prep initiation includes hepatitis b screening all patients being prescribed on oral prep should be screened for hepatitis b virus presence in people with active hepatitis b virus infection sometimes stopping oral prep medication can result in a rebound of hiv replication leading to fulminant liver damage hiv infection is not a contraindication to oral prep but patients with active hiv infection should be educated about the risks of stopping prep abruptly so that their liver function can be monitored closely for the reactivation of hepatitis b virus in the discover trial in the discover trial comparing uh, taf and ftc and uh, taf uh, tdf and fcc and taf and fcc for prep participants taking taf and ftc showed higher rates of triglyceride elevation and weight gain all patients using taf ftc should have their lipid profiles done this is the burning issue now with all this uh, uh, um, uh, weight gain even with uh, combination with integrase inhibitors with taf so lipid profile should be done and should be prescribed a lipid lowering agents like uh, uh pitavastatin most probably presently not available in india if it is indicated and available regarding uh, sti infections all prep candidates should be screened for chlamydia gonorrhea and syphilis so these are the ongoing assessment for patient using oral prep the 2021 updated prep guidelines uh, recommends a schedule of ongoing assessments so maintaining prep on patients by with laboratory data is also very crucial so these recommendation reflect the minimum investigations and healthcare provider should conduct additional assessment if really warranted so these are these assessment should be done it every 3 months 6 months and 1 year and at least in once in every 3 months repeat hiv testing and assess for signs and symptoms of acute infection to confirm that patients are still hiv negative this is a very important step at any point of time a prep candidate may become hiv positive because of uh, uh, poor adherence or uh, risky behavior provide a prescription or refill of oral prep medications for not more than 90 days so until the next hiv test so uh, giving a long duration is not also long duration refills also not advisable assess and provide support for adherence and risk reduction behaviors test all the sexually active patients with signs and symptoms of sexually transmitted infections screen asymptomatic uh, msms who are at high risk of uh, recurrent bacterial stis and provide access to sterile needles and syringes and substance use disorder treatment services to people who inject drugs respond to any new questions from the patients and provide them with any new information about the prep uses coming to every 6 months uh, uh, assessments monitor estimated gfr level for patients who are over the over 50 years of age or who had a egfr under 90 ml per minute when the when they started the oral prep if there are any other threats like kidney safety uh, such as hypertension or diabetes kidney function should be monitored more often 
are checked using additional tests like urine analysis or proteinuria, etc. A rising serum creatinine is not a reason to withhold PrEP if EGFR remains at least more than 60 ml per minute for uh, uh, FTC TDF or at least 30 ml for uh, uh, TAF and FTC. If EGFR is declining steadily but still at an acceptable level for the type of oral PrEP medication being used, consider counseling, uh, consulting a nephrologist uh, uh, for the needful. Screen all sexually active people for STAs, especially MSMs. Syphilis and gonorrhea for all PrEP users. Chlamydia, especially for MSMs and transgender women, even if they are asymptomatic. For every 12 months, monitor EGFR for all patients continuing on PrEP medication, monitoring triglycerides and cholesterol levels and wait for patients who are on TAF and FTC. Screen heterosexually active people for chlamydia, even if they are asymptomatic. As of now, the availability of injectable PrEP is not, uh, uh, availability of the injectable copitagravir is not available in India. So the ongoing assessments, we can skip this slide uh, because it is not uh, available read, readily in India now. So handling in indeterminate HIV test results. If a patient has an in indeterminate HIV test results at follow-up visit, uh, this is a tricky situation. Clinicians should work out to confirm the patient's true HIV status. Work with the patient to assess whether they have taken their PrEP medication as prescribed regularly since the last negative HIV test. Wait for a few days and then draw a new blood sample for repeat laboratory testing. These specimens should be tested using both an HIV antigen and antibody with a P24 and if required a PCR test also. If the repeat testing results show the patient has HIV, link them to the HIV care and linkage to care and HIV ART center. If the repeat test result confirm that the patient does not have HIV, PrEP can be continued. If the results are still unclear, try to get an expert advice. When the HIV status is confirmed for the patients using PrEP, prescribe a third drug like in post-exposure prophylaxis. As in PrEP, we give three drug regime for 28 days. If patient is found to have HIV on further testing, this regime can be considered as early ART and uh, uh, think that it is early ART initiation and it is to be continued. This option is easily applicable for patients who took PrEP with poor adherence. Stop oral PrEP medication for one to two weeks to get a clear test. If the patient has HIV, briefly stopping PrEP allows time for HIV replicate to occur and increases the likelihood that, the, that an HIV test will detect the virus if it is present. This is uh, telemedicine. Recently, after the COVID epidemic, telemedicine consultation replaced the clinic visits for PrEP. Conduct PrEP screening online, initiate PrEP and do follow-up visits by telemedicine consultations. Some, lab la some laboratories in our, uh, uh, in our areas are providing home sample collection services. Select a standard laboratory that conduct tests sensitive enough to detect the recent HIV infection. Once the HIV negative status is confirmed, consider writing a prescription for oral PrEP for 90-day supply rather than a 30-day supply. This will help patients to minimize trip to the pharmacy and to the clinics. Coming to how to discontinue the PrEP. How safely we have to discontinue and restart PrEP should be discussed with the patients both the times when they start the PrEP and when they discontinue the PrEP. The protection provided by daily oral PrEP wanes usually over 7 to 10 days after patient discontinues, discontinues its use. Because some patients have acquired HIV soon after stopping oral PrEP. So physicians should assess ongoing risk for HIV 
and discuss other preventive measures if HIV exposure is anticipated, including the PEP. For injectable PrEP, covatagravir levels slowly vary over many months after injections are discontinued. At some point of time during this tail phase, covatagravir levels will fall below a protective threshold and persist for some time at a non-protective levels. For these reasons, patients discontinuing covatagravir injections who may be at ongoing risk should be provided with another highly effective HIV preventive method during the months following their last injection. Clinicians should counsel the patients about the risk of developing drug-resistant HIV during the tail phase after the covitagravir injections are stopped or when the injections are missed. Additionally, healthcare providers should assess patients' ongoing risk of HIV exposure and prescribe daily oral PrEP within eight weeks after the last covitagravir injection or other prevention methods if HIV exposure is anticipated, they should be added a PEP also at that period. Finally, physicians should continue follow-up visits quarterly for 12 months and conduct antigen antibody and HIV RNA test at each visit. What are the special considerations for special populations? Coming to MSMs, this is called uh, on-demand PrEP or event-driven PrEP or coitally dependent PrEP. This is called, otherwise called as a 2-1-1 dosing PrEP. This 2-1-1-1 dosing on-demand or event-driven or coitally dependent PrEP, healthcare providers can prescribe this uh, FTC TDF. This is an off-label prescription. It is not approved using uh, 211 dosing for MSMs who request non-daily dosing, having sex infrequently, for example, less often or less than once a week. They can delay by taking this tablet, they can delay sex to permit the first pill, first two pills, to, uh, pill dose to act at least two hours before prior to the sex. When using 211 dosing, the patient takes TDF-FTC doses based on when they plan to have a sex. This is the regime. Two pills, two to 24 hours before sex. One pill, 24 hours after the first two pill dose. One pill, 48 hours after the first two pill dose. If patient continues to have sex after 2-1-1 dosing period, the patient should take additional doses like this. If the patient has sex on if the patient has sex on the day after completing 2-1-1 dose, take one pill per day until 48 hours after the last sexual event. If the gap of less than seven days occurs between the last pill and the next time they have sex, resume one pill per day. If the gap of seven days or more occurs between the last pill and the last time they have sex, start again the two pills. This is a complex regime. These are all complex regimes. 2-1-1 dosing should not be prescribed for patients who might have problems, adhering, adherence problems, and to a complex dosing regime, such as adolescent patients, usually they won't follow, and patients with an active substance use disorder. Note that 2-1-1 uh, dosing is not approved by FDA, and it is not recommended by CDC. So in this context, Capitogravir injections may be appropriate for people who have problems taking PrEP injections as prescribed. Let us see what is seasonal PrEP and transition PrEP or bridge PrEP. Seasonal PrEP is considered for individuals who travel uh, for a longer period uh, in a high prevalence setting uh, for a specific period like uh, some holiday trips and holidays. So this, in this case, initiate PrEP. Uh, prior to starting of a trip, seven days in men, 21 days women and transgenders. Continue it for 28 days after the last sexual encounter. Follow the guidelines of daily prep initiation and follow. So transition prep is bridge prep is another, another type of prep in zero discardant couples in which the uninfected partner uses prep till the time the infected partner achieves the below detectable levels with ART. Prep for transgender people. Transgenders who use gender-affirming hormones having HIV risk factors can use PrEP. 
although clear data on whether PrEP interacts with the hormone therapy used by transgender women are lacking, evidence, present evidence suggests that there are no drug-drug interaction with hormones. There are three PrEP regimens approved for transgender women and other people assigned male at birth. Daily oral TDF FTC or TAF FTC, Cobitagravir injections every two months. There are two PrEP regimes approved for transgender men and other people assigned female at birth who may have receptive vaginal sex. Daily oral TDF and TAF, Cobitagravir injection every two months. Transgender men who engage in receptive vaginal intercourse should not use daily oral TAF FTC for PrEP. TAF FTC is not approved. It is also not approved for people assigned female at birth who are at risk of getting HIV through receptive vaginal sex. PrEP used in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Studies have shown that the risk of getting HIV is higher during conception and lactation, especially when people are having sex without condoms. PrEP with TDF and FTC or Covitagravi can help to protect people who are seeking to conceive or who are pregnant or breastfeeding and have a sexual partner with HIV, especially if the partner's viral load is unknown, is detectable, or can't be documented as undetectable. TDF FTC and Capitogravir are FDA approved for use by women and other people at risk of getting HIV through vaginal sex, including those who are pregnant or breastfeeding. TAF FTC is not approved for use in women or other people who could get HIV through receptive as Earlier we discussed this. If the partner's viral load is less than 200 copies per ml are undetectable, there is effectively no risk of transmitting of HIV through sex, as all of us know. U is equal to U. However, PrEP may provide additional protection if the partner's viral load is inconsistently undetectable and if there are multiple sexual partners. The effects of PrEP on babies exposed to the two medications through breast milk have not been studied till now. However, studies of mothers with HIV who breastfed while taking antiretroviral medications for HIV treatment suggest that babies have limited drug exposure through breast milk. PrEP for adolescents. TDF FTC, TAF FTC and injectable Covitagravir are approved for PrEP in high-risk adolescents weighing at least 35 kgs in combination with other safe sex practices to reduce the risk of sexually acquired HIV. We discussed earlier that adolescents and young adults aged between 13 to 24 comprises about 20% of all new HIV infections in the United States. Commence hepatitis B and human papilloma virus vaccines to all the PrEP users if indicated. So this is uh, completion of uh, PrEP. Now we discuss uh, PEP briefly. Uh, this is PEP is the use of antiretroviral drugs after a single high risk event, either non-occupational or occupational exposure to stop HIV zero conversion. PEP must be started as soon as possible to be effective and always within 72 hours of a possible exposure. PEP should be given for 28 days. So in clinical studies for PEP, TDF, FTC and integrase inhibitor is a preferred regime. The role of tenofovir alfanamide in PEP, there is no adequate data. But in in day to day clinical practice, we are routinely using TAF. But as such, there is no data to use TAF in post exposure prophylaxis. Before initiating PEP, a, do a, a, a rule out HIV and HBV infections. PEP should be given for twenty eight days. And uh, as you know, the TDF, FTC, and uh, integrase inhibitor is a preferred regime. This is the algorithm given by CDC for the evaluation of possible non-occupational HIV exposure and treatment with PEP. PEP is also very effective 
if taken with a good adherence for 28 days, it has 98 to 90, 99% efficacy. In a high risk, either in non-occupational non or occupational exposure settings, if the HIV positive source is an ART and has an undetectable viral load, PEP is not recommended. So nowadays, uh, PEP is overused and uh, it is over prescribed. So if the source patient is undetectable, if you can able to see that, there is no need for PEP. PEP is a two drug combination of ARVs taken to prevent HIV and can be used by adults and adolescents at risk of getting HIV. Obtaining a brief sexual history from each patient is very important. Prescribing PrEP can be easily integrated into primary care settings. In fact, PrEP is similar to other preventive medications such as oral contraceptives for pregnancy prevention, statins for people at high risk of getting cardiovascular disease, and metformin for people of risking getting diabetes. Several NGOs like Accelerate and Mitri Clinics uh, for uh, LGBTQIA plus communities will assist in taking PrEP, especially to transgenders and MSMs. Three PrEP medications are approved in India, TDF-FTC, TDF-3TC, TAF-FTC. Cobitagravir IM injection is still not available in India at present. Consider PrEP as one of the comprehensive HIV preventive strategies which should also include condom use and treatment of STVs. All three will go together. Any registered medical practitioner with little training in, in national HIV treatment guidelines can provide PrEP. Specialization in infectious diseases or HIV care is not required. PrEP is usually well tolerated and it is 99% effective in preventing HIV transmission through the sexual route and at least 74% effective in preventing HIV transmission in IV drug users. PrEP can be prescribed to any adult or adolescent patient who asks for it, even if they don't report specific risk factors for the acquisition of HIV. Patient may ask for PrEP to protect themselves, but are sometimes unwilling to share more information about their sexual behaviors with healthcare personnel if they, they, if they fear encountering stigma or discrimination. Having cordial conversation about PrEP with the patients can help them to overcome embarrassment about their IV drug injections and sexual behaviors. Additionally, clinicians should prioritize taking sexual and substance use history from all the patients. This information is essential to understand each patient's risk of getting HIV and PrEP might be the choice for them. Advice PrEP and PEP as and when indicated, prevent HIV, stop AIDS. Thanks for your patient hearing. Thank you so much, sir, for a valuable insights on uh, PREP and uh, PEP. So, sir, we have some uh, questions in the chat box, uh, which I would like you to address. There are quite a few. So, first question is from Dr. Narendra Bhai Rambhai Patel. Uh, he asked, do all high-risk diabetic patients be on insulin before PrEP? So, usually giving insulin in a uncontrolled diabetes is a preferable uh, choice of uh, treatment. Uh, but PrEP, because uh, PrEP contains uh, I mean, uh, weight gain and uh, metabolic complications are uh, known with, uh, uh, you know, when, when combined, uh, actually, TAF, it is known for causing uh, uh, weight gain and metabolic problems. If the really sugars are very high, uh, controls are very poor, like uh, when the HBS, uh, HbA1c levels are very high and if the sugar levels are crossing more than 300, uh, better to put the patient on insulin and give PrEP. Okay. But uh, PrEP, there is no, uh, uh, there is no role of, uh, you, you know, integrated stand transmit inhibitors. But the uh, INSTAs have some interaction with uh, metformin, diabetics, uh, uh, that is another point. But uh, in those cases, insulin is preferred. But uh, insulin is also an anabolic hormone, uh, may, may facilitate weight gain along with tenofovir. But uh, I mean, along with TAF. TAF insulin weight gain studies are not done probably. Okay. So, next question we have from uh, Dr. Rajesh Sethia. 
he asked for preferred investigations to rule out chlamydia and gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is a smear. Uh, I mean, uh, urethral smear uh, uh, demonstrates the diplococci. Uh, chlamydia, uh, it's difficult, but uh, 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 PCR for chlamydia may be a, 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 a very reliable investigation, uh, but uh, symptomatically we treat. But uh, as such, chlamydia, the straight away, uh, there is no, uh, uh, you can do the serology and PCR may be, may be confirmed. So next question is from Dr. Bishal Gupta. He asked that healthcare workers who are exclusively for HIV patients unit or the medical technologists who are at ICTC unit handling HIV positive blood, is there any role or indication of PrEP? As we discussed in this uh, thing, uh, so uh, these people will uh, encounter an occupational exposure. So source patient condition and, and the scenario uh, with the exposure is very important. If, uh, as we discussed in this presentation, if the source patient is already on ART medications and maintaining a below detectable viral loads, there, there is no need for PrEP. Uh, PEP. So PEP is not indicated, but not always we can get uh, uh, not always we can get source patient details. So, so in that scenario, in the doubtful scenario, uh, to eliminate the, it is in the discretion by case to case basis. If uh, there is a, a, a strong injury suggesting deep injury uh, and grade two injuries, then we can consider giving PEP. Okay. One more question from his side. What is the current status of PrEP in India? Can it be given in uh, can it be given in government institutes or only it is limited within the private sector? As we discussed uh, in the in our presentation, that PrEP has come into existence in India some 10-15 years back, but uh, it doesn't uh, come very uh, you know the PrEP uh, usage in India is very very less because. Uh, because of uh, PrEP is mostly useful for MSMs and transgenders and those uh, in, in that uh, particular segment, the PrEP usage is there. In India, uh, because uh, uh, the, the discrimination, stigma, this is the main role, main cause uh, uh, for PrEP being not used properly. But nowadays, all these voluntary organization, all these groups, LGBTQ plus groups and all, and the voluntary organizations like Accelerate, Mitra, Mitra Clinics, they are, uh, they, are, they are bridging between the treating doctors and the, um, these key populations. With those, uh, with those, uh, with, those with, with their intermediate uh, link between us and the key population, PrEP usage has been increasing, but educated MSMs and all are directly coming to clinics and asking for PrEP. But I think in coming a uh, few years period, PrEP usage will be very much increased. Tenfold increase will be expected in coming two, three years. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is from Dr. Tarun. He asked that can we prescribe FDC of TLD, TLE if TDF uh, 3TC or TDF FTC is not available? Madam, madam, please repeat the question. Yeah, sorry, sir. So, uh, can we prescribe FDC of TLD and TLE if yes. TDF and 3TC or TDF and FTC is not available? So, TD, actually, in our NACO guidelines, only TDF, I mean, uh, TDF and uh, uh, 3TC is recommended uh, by NACO for PrEP, uh, you know. Uh, TAF uh, FTC is not there in the PrEP guidelines of uh, NACO. So it can be recommended only difference is only difference is the creatinine clearance. If the creatinine clearance of an individual is less than 60 and uh, uh, more than 30, a TAF can be given. If it is more than 60, uh, TDF uh, can be given. TDF and 3TC can be given. But the only thing is they monitor kidney function uh, once in every three months, six months, and one year. Because a transient rise in creatinine is expected with uh, uh, TDF, 
but uh, real egfr will not decrease creatine values may may increase but once the drug is stopped uh, usually these things will be but the prep if you use for a longer time years together uh, as well, as like any other tdf preparation uh, so there uh, the kidney function has to be monitored so tdf associated uh, nephrotoxicity tubular tubular toxicity is reported in several cases but in prep cases renal toxicities are rarely reported in india uh, so similar to what you just mentioned just an extension of the same dr ravi teja asked that for how long prep can be advised in individual with prolonged high risk exposure as long as the uh, as long as the uh, person is uh, under uh, under constant exposure it is uh, uh, it is indicated uh, the other partner if, if the partner the ta prep taking person if he is in the risk of getting hiv it is indicated as long as he is in the risk period uh, so next question is from dr sanjay swain he asked that can tld be used for both prep and pep yes madam yes okay uh i think that's all with the questions in the chat box sir audience if you have any any more questions now is the time to ask uh in the meantime uh thank you so much sir for your uh valuable uh insights uh we sincerely uh hope that you all the you all found today's webinar to be informative and and uh and enlightening the knowledge and perspective shared by dr satyanarayan sir will be surely a will have a lasting imp uh, impact and will definitely help you all to navigate the challenges in utilizing and implementing prep and pep i would also like to thank uh, our uh, all uh, sorry all our delegates for your time and active participation and their valuable contribution throughout the webinar so dr mayank kekar says that the inform uh, that the uh, session was very informative and it was a very simplified presentation same thank from you. dr dipali shrivastav she is thanking you sir thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to share uh, my experiences with you the pleasure is all ours sir so uh, let us conclude today's evening uh, thank you everyone for your active participation and your time thank you so much sir for uh, sparing the time and educating us about prep and pep hope you all to see you soon in the future wishing you all a, a continued success and a bright future good evening and good night thank you so much sir thank, thank you, you delegates thank you very much thank you sir